Um, I am going to try to be as brief as possible. I'm going to use these slides, but I'm not really going to talk from the slides, I hope. But I'm going to put them up as props so that you can look at some things while I go. Um, this is, I'm not a specialist in Africa. I really am a specialist in Civil War and its recurrence. I wrote a book on Civil War recurrence and why some Civil Wars recur after they've ended and why others haven't. And so I'm going to talk about that. But what I, and, you know, there's websites that you can go to and find like all the peace agreements that have been signed since 1989 in Africa and so forth. And so I just wanted to list some of these because see, some of these are some of the more notable ones that I just want to point out. And the ones in red are the ones that are clear failures. And I want to point out one thing about those, those two first failures, Angola and, and Rwanda. Many people, the Rwanda genocide is in part attributable to the failure of that peace agreement that was signed in 1993, about six months before the genocide took place in April of 1994. And so the, the sense that there were winners and losers in that peace agreement drove extremists to go after moderates. And that was part of the dynamic of what happened with the genocide. So these peace agreements are important and they're dangerous. And in those two cases, the war and the casualties that occurred after a failed peace were worse than the war all the, all the way up to the peace agreement that was signed at that time. So that's the, that's the first thing I'll say. The second, I'll just mention about Angola. Angola is a case when I teach, I say Angola is a great case where one individual makes a huge difference in peace success and failure of an implementation. So uh, Jonas Savimbi basically was a spoiler and when he lost the elections he went back to war and there were a few other peace agreements but they never worked and after he died in 2002 within a few months boom the rebels reached an agreement and the war ended and so it's, it's my favorite example of how one individual can make a big difference in these processes um, the others I just want to point out some successes right so South Africa 1991 is probably the most important agreement but it wasn't about so you know South Africa all of these cases are sui generis is the point I want to make. So South Africa was both a case of apartheid and it was the transition from apartheid that was just as important as a transition from armed conflict with the ANC, which was in some sense an armed expression of the resentment over apartheid. And so that transition was both a transition to democracy and a transition from war to peace. It was successful, obviously. Um, lots of post-war problems without question, but generally considered a success. But um, I wanted to put it up there so that you think of South Africa also has some form of, of peace process as well. Liberia, Sierra Leone, Mozambique, all considered now, as of today, successful cases of uh, peace implementation um, and also with uh, important UN involvement by the UN, peace, uh, UN peacekeeping operation in all of those cases. Um, I want to point out that Liberia, you know, in all of these cases, if you go and look at data sets, these are just the important ones. There were 16, there were 15 failed peace agreements before 2003 in Liberia, before it got to that. And that goes to a certain extent to one issue that I think is important to understand about Africa, which is Africa is a, is a, is a, is a continent of lowly institutionalized states formally. And so where you have, low, I basically think that where you have low degrees of institutionalization, you have low ability to enforce agreements and agreements has was just of referred to as pre, uh, President Kiir of South Sudan, I think. That agreement is just a piece of paper. Uh, that's what Habya Rimana said when he signed in 1993, president of Rwanda. He said, it's just a piece of paper. It means nothing to sign these things. It's just for the international audience. And so the degree to which these peace agreements mean something and don't mean something is really hard to tell. But pe people who know the cases know pretty well. So I remember Nepal, before the Nepal peace agreement in 2006, Everybody wanted to work in the Nepal mission, the UN mission in Nepal who, that I knew who worked at the UN because everyone had a good sense that Nepal had all the makings of a successful implementation even before it happened. You knew it was going to work. And I could explain to you why, but there, there are factors that you know. That most of the experts who work on these cases have a sense of whether or not it's going to be successful or not. At least, uh, you know, not entirely, but have a sense of, oh, this is, you know, hogwash. It's never going to work. Um, South Sudan, I just want to point out, the violence, of, you know, South Sudan is a successful implementation of a peace agreement between Sudan and its insurgent neighbor, uh, its insurgent, its insurgency in the south, that led to a referendum on independence, and that is basically I was like that's a successful peace agreement, and it was implemented just like it should have been. And when South Sudan became independent, in fact, the seeds of dissent were there within South Sudan, and once it became independent, then you had things fall apart, and within two years you have a really bloody. City civil war that occurs with, between factions within South Sudan. So these things are interrelated, and it's important to think about the consequences of these these agreements. So I flag a successful interstate peace agreement. They're very rare, and one happened this year in Eritrea and Ethiopia. 
I don't fully understand why it happened now, right? That's, maybe Jennifer knows that, but um, I want to say I've got about six slides here that I'm going to run through. Um, this one is essentially what the literature says about what successful structural factors are in why P succeeds or fails, okay? And this is like the literature from the quantitative stuff, okay? And I looked at this when I wrote this book that I wrote five years ago on why peace fails. Um, and these are some of the literature. It says poverty, GDP per capita. It, these are risk factors. Oil dependency, ethic and religious fractionalization. And more recently in this World Bank UN report that I worked on last year called um, Pathways for Peace, which was the first joint World Bank UN report ever. It was focused on conflict prevention, trying to mobilize more resources and clarity about what we need to do with money for conflict prevention instead of just doing response, like investing more in prevention because the response is getting out of control because peacekeeping budget's going up, refugees are going up. We need to prevent these crises that are costing so much on the international infrastructure and resource base. And so horizontal inequality was one of the big important risk factors that came out of that study which is kind of a little bit of answer against the just, it's not just poverty, it's actually inequality that lies along ethnic or religious or other identity lines, okay? Um, in all of those cases that I just mentioned, the point I want to make is there's, these are all statistically significant according to a good number of an analysis that has taken place, enough that most people are comfortable saying, yeah, those are relevant factors. That doesn't mean they're important factors in terms of substantive significance. It just means, it, so what it really means is if you're an oil dependent state, then you have a, maybe a two to four percent higher chance in any given year of having a war than somebody who's not an oil dependent state does. It's not that much. And so building policy around these correlations is actually not the answer to preventing and responding to civil wars or civil war recurrence, okay? And so it's important to have these programs that focus on poverty and inequality, but really anticipating in a given country when you think it's going to happen and what the actual triggers are, responding urgently to those triggers is, is far more important in my view than, than ignoring that and just focusing on the long-term structural factors because the substantive significance of those and impact of those is, is, is relatively small, okay? Um, the last thing I'm going to mention is what the, the finding that I had when I wrote this book was exclusionary behavior. I was actually surprised. I didn't know the answer to this question about why some civil wars recur and others don't when I started the book project. And what I found was actually what happened in a lot of cases um, was that a lot of cases, meaning like 85% of the cases of, re of recurrence, is that the government or the post-war regime engaged in exclusionary behavior, whether rebels or negotiated government or a victorious government government. Um, they engaged in exclusionary behavior that violated the expectations that the other side had after a war and drove them to pick up arms again. And so that's what happened in Liberia after 1997. Charles Taylor became president in a, what everyone thought was a successful peace agreement in 1996-97. And within a couple of years, he was engaging in such exclusionary behavior and cutting out the former enemies and, and assassinating some of them that the insurgency rose up again. And, um, and then he was toppled, driven off, and is now in jail. But um, so that is, that is one of the things that I think is actually really important to look at and is part of looking at the horizontal inequality behavior that goes along with that, I would say. So, um, I want to mention that we are, the framing of the session was on negotiated settlements. But in fact, a lot of wars don't end with negotiated settlements. And so before the Cold War ended in 19, let's say 89, very, very, very few cases of civil wars ended in negotiated settlements. Almost all of them ended in victory or a lesser percentage ending, ended in what I call petering out. So essentially it just drifts off, the opposition melts away. Um, and so what I want to point out is that that changed um, s significantly during the post-Cold War era where a what uh, Georgetown professor Lise Moore J. Howard and one of her colleagues there uh, wrote about in an article this, earlier this year, I think, um, which is that like the norm of, of civil war negotiated settlement rose up and became quite popular, as it were, and that's like was a widely accepted way to end conflicts and was expected to be that way and the international organizational bureaucracy went along with it and major states like the United States and Britain and France and, uh, and even others, uh, support China, supported that way of ending conflicts. And certainly the Soviet Union did, which is why the, the Central American cases ended and the Southern African cases ended in the early 90s. It's because essentially Jim Baker and the Soviet Union 
just and Shevardnadze basically said, let's settle these damn things and get them going. And that's what we saw to a large extent. So the reason I, I and so the reason I mention this is um, is for two reasons. One is that first of all, all of these wars have a high rate of recurrence between one fourth and a half, depending on which scholar you consult and which database they use. And the other reason is that negotiated wars is widely agreed, disputed data sets, that negotiated settlements have a higher failure rate than victories, right? So this has been used recently to say, why don't we just push for victories and Lynn will have settlements and then we won't have to worry about this stuff, right? Or um, has one scholar argued famously, why not let them fight themselves out, give war a chance? Edward Lutvak's article that was called Give War a Chance uh, 20 years ago. Um, which is like, why should we intervene and stop these processes when they, and just let them burn themselves out? And so I just want to point out there's some reasons why, and that is one of them is humanitarian reasons are very important. Political pressures on international actors to do something about these conflicts is also very important. Um, and so, and there are moral reasons not to essentially back victories. But increasingly now with the rise of terrorism and terrorist actors and non-state actors in these conflicts, Victories, the international community, the, the norm of negotiating these subtle wars, civil wars, has ebbed. And so in this article that I mentioned, they show that, in fact, um, victories have become more numerous as ways of ending civil wars since 2010. And so we see that has an outcome is more popular. And I'll come back to the terrorism threat at the end of this, okay? Um, I think that uh, those are... Um, but, uh, oh, I also want to point out that victories... One of the downsides of victories that the scholarship shows is that there's a higher chance of genocide and a little bit higher chance of exclusion, even if it's not perceived exclusion and doesn't necessarily lead to recurrence, but there is a de facto exclusion, but usually it's because the loser's lost and can't do anything about, about revan uh, revan revan revenge, if you will. Okay? Um, let me talk about some of the factors. I just have a couple of slides on different factors of implementation that shapes success and failure that different scholars have pointed to. So first I'm just going to talk about the quality and inclusion of mediation is, has been found to be important in different ways. And so one of that is the mediators themselves, like how much experience they have, what their qualities are, if they're built for mediation. The UN is paying more attention to that. And so just instead of just appointing the former prime minister of uh, pick your con the Netherlands to go off and be a mediator. They're like, uh, nah, I'm sure you're very good, but we really have somebody who has some experience at this who also was a, minister, a foreign minister, but he worked and he's done lots of mediation, and so we're going to go with that person. Or women who have been involved and so as well. So, so that's one of the things. And the, thing, the reason this is on the list here for those of you who work in the U.S. government is the U.S. government doesn't actually invest in training its mediators very much. There's kind of an assumption inside the State Department that, well, we're foreign service officers. <laughs> we went to Foreign Service Institute. We know what we're doing. That's what we're built for. That's what, by definition, we are mediators. And so there's a little bit of resistance <laughs> that we found inside the State Department <laughs> to, well, it might be worse than DOD. I don't know, right? So, but there's, but DOD certainly has a culture of training that civilian institutions don't have, obviously, because TOD has a lot more resources for it. And they have a little more time on their hands. But anyway, we can go on, we can go on on that. But, um, but, but state basically is, we should do more of that training and preparation for our mediators inside the State Department is the point I want to leave you with, with that, okay? Um, the second thing is the legitimacy of the mediator is really important. And this is really important for a US government that is looked upon askance in some corners of the world, much as we might not think we are. For the U.S. to get involved as a mediator, for example, in the Colombian mediation, would have been the death knell for the FARC. The FARC were like, no, are you kidding me? They're the enemy. We're fighting them. Let's face it. So the U.S. couldn't play a mediation role in Colombia. Not only that, but the U.S., the Obama administration, and Kevin Whitaker, who was the head of, who was the DAS at the time, for the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indies, he was very, very strict inside state about saying, we will not be publicly, we are not going to say a public word about this, except we support the government. If the government wants to mediate, we'll support the government. Any questions? Yeah. How about the FARC? Our answer is we support the government. If the government wants to mediate, we support the government. And he did that because he didn't want to topple the apple cart on the negotiations to provoke the FARC to walk away from the table. Because anything he said that was like, we think the FARC should come to the table, then the FARC would be like, ah, we're running away from the table. Right? And so 
So they were very strategic about being silent in a way that some people took to be anti-peace, but in fact was pro-peace. And so that's an example of how the U.S. might actually be a negative factor in a mediation role. But I also want to point out the sub-regional actors, particularly in Africa, and ECOWAS is probably the best example of this, ha has developed a culture and an expectation of being the first mediator of first resort, the AU of second resort, and the UN of third resort. And in fact, the most successful mediations that we've had, particularly preventing crises and coups in places like Mauritania and Guinea, have been when the th mediators or senior special envoys are from all three of those institutions team up, travel together, meet with everybody simultaneously, so that the actors know that there's no light between those different levels of leverage that are being exercised. Um, and the last thing is I'll talk about the inclusiveness of mediation implementation. There's recent scholarship in the last decade have shown that civil society participation increases the chances that a peace agreement will hold for a longer period of time. Um, that's just writ large. And then there's, actually, there's also uh, data that shows that um, women in role in negotiation also has a positive impact. And so I will, I, this is where I will refer you to some of the stats on here, um, in particular these last two statistics where I'll say peace agreements are 20% more likely to last at least two years when women are included, uh, a result of a study that was just a couple, done just a couple years ago, and a peace agreement is 35% more likely to last for 15 years if women participate in its creation. And so um, we're seeing some more participation because of the norm about women's participation. And so I think that there's certainly a norm of that, and that was, I just will mention Colombia again, because it, when the Colombian negotiators went to the table initially, there were probably 30 people around the table, um, close to that, I think, I don't know the exact number, but only one person was a woman, and that was like one of the, fee one of the Norwegian mediation team. It was not from the government or the FARC. It was from the mediation team. And so women organized, pushed, lobbied, and a third of the people on, for each party eventually were women, and as a result of that, um, more attention to gender DDR, uh, gender de demobilization, disarmament, and re uh, reintegration w took place, more attention to women in uh, humanitarian affairs came out. It made a difference in the substance of the agreement is my point, okay? Um, I see I'm at like almost 20 minutes here. Um, so I'm gonna leave that and go on to the last uh, thing I wanna say before then I turn to some of the sort of conditions that, that make things different today that will lead into the Mali discussion. Here are some other things that um, make a difference in implementation. One of them is resources. So some peace processes, so there's a difference between mediation and negotiating and getting to agreement and implementing the agreement. And so what happened in the 1990s is after we had all these successful peace agreements that were started to be reached in places like Mozambique and Angola, uh, not Angola, and El Salvador and Nicaragua and Guatemala was, and Cambodia was, wow, peace agreements, that's the game. How do we get to peace agreements? And then all of a sudden people are like, oh man, no, no, no. Peace agreements is just the beginning. Once you get the peace agreement, then the hard work is actually implementing the damn thing. So now there's a literature on peace implementation. And this is based on that literature because peace implementation is very hard. And it has different challenges on depending on whether it's a victory or a, or a negotiated settlement. The tools of leverage are different because a victorious government has usually some claim to sovereignty that gives a little bit more power to say no to the international community, for example. Fewer hooks, I would say, unless you're the patron of the victorious government. So one of those is uh, there's a vast difference in how resourced these peace processes are. The Balkans got far more resources for peace implementation than any other region of the world uh, in the last 20 years. Robust monitoring and verification, spoiler management, this is basically about peacekeeping or other troops that deploy to the region and how robust they are, how resourced they are, how up to the task they are, and that is highly relevant in Mali, where many people believe that the peacekeeping operation in Mali is there they're so concerned, they're, they're too few, and they're not resourced to take on a counterterrorism counter mission, which is part of what they need to do to survive. So they're just hunkered down protecting themselves and trying to protect a few civilians, and they're not up to the task, and they need to, do, they need to rethink that mission. And that's one of the results of a strategic review that was done by the UN earlier this year. And so the Secretariat and the member states are trying to figure out, should we ramp it up? Should we ramp it down? Well, we've got to do something different, because it's not properly tasked for the mission. Okay? Um, I'll leave that point because uh, powerful states diplomatic investment. So there's a big difference when a single state is invested in something like 
occurred in Liberia, where the United States was invested, in Sierra Leone, where the UK was invested and sent troops to like mop up a mess before the peace, to make sure the peace agreement worked, actually, in the early 2000s, in Cote d'Ivoire, where the French were invested, versus places like Somalia, South Sudan, and CAR, where no member state, no important member state has deployed troops in order to actually back up the mission in a sustained way. The French did it in the CR a little bit. So Mali is an interesting case, as you'll hear, because the French have actually stepped up and in Operation Barkhan are deploying their own operation that is not under UN command, that is doing the heavy lifting of counterterrorism, and how that interacts with, um, that's an important factor of success, I would say, for that mission, if there's going to be success. The last thing I'll say is core state institutions and building state institutions is now accepted to be a really important factor in peace implementation. And those core institutions include the police and the military, as well as finance ministries and justice ministries and the execution of justice, etc. So the last thing I'll say to close is, okay, is this still relevant in today's day, day and age? And there's some important things that have changed in the nature of conflict, and I hear that Darina did a presentation earlier this week that you guys got already, so I hope I'm not, I'll just mention a few things because I don't want to repeat what was already done. But we have a surge in conflict that you probably already saw, but part of what I want to point out is much of that is in Africa and the Middle East, and more importantly, the battle deaths that have happened since 2011, 68% of them have happened in the Middle East. And what we see in the Middle East is actually not many UN peacekeeping operations in the Middle East. What we see in the Middle East are bilateral states that are acting and interacting, and there's not really international presence that's effectively managing those conflicts. The UN and the Security Council have failed to either get in or manage those very effectively. Afghanistan and Iraq are both political missions, so they're kind of, it's kind of a little misleading to have them not have peacekeeping operations there, just for the record. But um, these other places, we have really important, you know, the most lethal conflicts on Earth don't have any troop presence on the ground to try to manage them, and so it's a very diplomatic, it's essentially dipl diplomacy is the, is the only ticket in town, okay? Um, and the last thing I'll say um, is, is, the, is the, the, different the rise of terrorism has a factor in these conflicts. So 90% of the conflicts that were, in, uh, that were existed that had, there were major conflicts of the last five years, 90% of them had some terrorist component to them. And the UN has been reluctant to engage in counterterrorism, and partly because it is not up, it is not, the member states have not decided to equip the United Nations to do those jobs. Let's put it that way. Um, and, but it, the name of the game of mediation changes if the aims of a terrorist organization is not to gain power and you can negotiate and say, hey, do you want five ministries of the 14 ministries and you can control these mines in the country and then the DRC rebels say, okay, we'll do that, we'll put down our arms and come in. Well, if the aim is to create a transnational caliphate and, and it's an ideologically driven aim that is transnational, then giving them a share of power in a local government in Nigeria is not going to make Boko Haram go away. It's going to, they're going to be like, ha, 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 get out of our face. We're here to defeat you, not to negotiate with you. And so it's really complicated to have that dynamic if you're trying to mediate with groups that are using terrorist tactics, which is different than the challenge of international actors who decide that there's no negotiating with these people. We're going to defeat them. But then there are other actors involved. And how do you do state building? And how do you reach peace with those actors while there's a counterterrorism thing going on? So it's a much more complicated picture for mediation. And that certainly exists in places like Nigeria and Mali um, and maybe Cameroon increasingly um, in this day and age. So I'll stop there. <laughs>